probably once a month or twice a month, sometimes on the live stream, sometimes on the YouTube video. But at the end of hopefully a couple of months, we're going to have a full playlist on the YouTube channel where you can follow along the whole process of the creation of this dragon. And of course, Motu Man, we're going to be answering your question. So before we jump into the dragon, we got a very, very important question by Motu Man, which is about procrastination. So procrastination, at least for me, feels like a gamble where myself is telling my future self, hey, you can handle it. You're going to be fine. You can do whatever you want right now and nothing's going to happen, right? You can go play games or watch some TV. And it's it's very damaging because you're, you're pretty much investing in the future or hoping that the future will solve the situation for you. Now, I saw a tip very recently that was called the procrastination like a solution or something like that. And it, tell, it tells the following. It says, when you're feeling like you don't want to do something, like in this case, work on 3D or whatever, try going somewhere else and do exactly what you want to do, but without distractions. So if you're like, hey, I want to, I don't know, read a book. Okay, go grab your book, get in a chair and start reading the book a little bit, but don't have your cell phone on. Don't get near the computer or near a TV because that's where you get the distractions and you're getting like completely like stimulated by all of the different um, all of these different elements and you you just never get bored enough to start working on whatever you need to work. So the recommendation was that try to get rid of as many distractions as possible because distractions are the ones that kind of like get the procrastination going. Another tip that I can give you about that, and this is one that I like to do very often, is if I'm really not feeling creative, like I really don't feel like recording or like doing something here on the computer, I, I still try to find a way to use that time like intelligently and, and learn something. Maybe I don't wanna do 3D, but maybe I can watch a tutorial or I can read the documentation for a software or I can just look ArtStation for cool stuff and just like have fun learning and seeing what other people are doing. Those kind of activities, I would say are more valuable for you as an artist than trying to just like scroll through TikTok or through YouTube like shorts or whatever and, and wasting time because that's a waste of time. If you have fun, are getting distracted doing something, but it's all related and you're learning at least something from it, then, I mean, it's not ideal, but it's better than nothing, right? So yeah, that's, uh, that's one of my advices for procrastination. There you go. TikTok and Instagram are evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, they're very they're very cool tools, and and that's the thing. Everything is a tool at the end of the day, but when the tool becomes a a damaging thing, as Jax is saying right there, that's when we get a problem. Let's see. Comey, I'll, I'll take a look at your model after the stream is done, okay? Because right now it's gonna uh, it's gonna be a little bit difficult to do that. Clubberton, what's up, man? Cool. So let's go over what we're going to be doing, guys. And um, I was telling you, or, or I was actually thinking, like, what could we do? And, and there's one thing that I've never really done as a 3D artist in this 13, 14 years that I've been doing this. And that's a dragon. Dragons have always been... Dark Magician, thank you. Dragons have always been very challenging for me. And, and I told myself that whenever I do a dragon, I really want to do it the right way. I think the last sort of, like, dragon that I did was just like a dragon head and it was what like nine years ago eight years ago something like that it's here on my art station it was just a quick sketch and i was actually trying some um some displacement map uh, workflow it's this one right here stone dragon seven years ago this was the last dragon that i did and it was a quick sculpt it took me like maybe like three hours to do or something back in the day so i've never actually done like a like a full dragon and i thought hey that's gonna be a, a good idea right so yesterday i was sketching this guy right here this is my sketch and i had this idea of this like old strong dragon like a chunky dragon um i got very inspired by the newest uh like pathfinder dragons which is this one right here it's like chunky dragon i think this is like the stone dragon Pr primal dragon adamantine there you go so for those of you that don't know, Pathfinder is like the competition to D&D. I actually think they're a little bit better than D&D in, um, in the mechanics of the game. But that's a discussion for another day. And they're doing the remaster and, um, and they're showing some of the new dragons. And this one they showed a couple of weeks ago. Unfortunately, I cannot just do this one because I do not own the concept. So I told my friend Edsfox, who might be joining us here in the chat, to help me. So I sent him this sketch right here. 
and he started doing this ideas right here so i really like where this is going like i really like the head right here proportions of the body i do feel they might be a little bit short like i understand because some of the dragons tend to be shorter like this one's right here like the traditional dnd dragons but i really like like the like the game of thrones dragons that they've been using in the shows which are a lot longer a lot slender that's why i got like a like a brachios brachiosaurus i think it's a brachiosaurus so so we're probably gonna be going for a a, a longer dragon um on the element but we'll see we'll see that's gonna depend on the <laughs> on the blasphemy sets lord tell him hey, I, I i got my opinions my friend uh, i've been playing pathfinder for the past what like eight months no almost a year i think yeah it's ever since the ogl debacle last year and uh my group at least has enjoyed it a little bit more than than dnd now this is the dragons that they've been using for game of thrones but here's now here's a, a point of discussion right technically technically these are not dragons. I believe if, the, if my terminology, if my fantasy terminology is not wrong, that these are considered wyverns. Because dragons are supposed to have the four legs and two wings. And the Game of Thrones dragons don't have four legs, two wings. They have two legs, two wings, and arms. So more like a bat, right? So so that's the that's the difference there. We are going to be doing a dragon. So this is the one, right? So yeah, let's jump into Zebrush and let's start sculpting. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Uh, Tranquil Dingbad. Yes, my friend, if you if anyone has any like uh, mentorship um, inquiries, they want to have a mentorship with myself, then just email me or e email me. Yeah, you can email me as well. Or just send me a DM on Discord and uh, I can explain uh, the pricing, the structure, how we normally like handle those types of um, of elements. I do have limited slots. Like I cannot give mentorships to everyone because otherwise I would not have time to do the courses and the uh, and the uh, and the YouTube videos and all that stuff. But uh, just keep it in mind. Tony, what's up, man? Welcome to the stream. John Howe is very good to yeah. John Howe is amazing. Please do a reading workshop on bone orientation. I'm struggling a bit with that. You did good, man. I, I I saw your the stuff that you sent me, and it was fine. It was just a couple of them that needed to be oriented properly. I think you might find a little bit of the joint information on the chest tutorial that I did. There you go. I would love to see four leg dragons in Game of Thrones. Yeah, right. I mean, I understand why they didn't, though. Because I think four legged dragons are a little bit. They're a little bit more into the fantasy realm of things, right? And um, and two legged dragons, they can look, or they look a little bit more, I don't know, predatory or something like that, more menacing. So I, I guess that's why they did that. So we're gonna start today with only the neck and the, and the head, like the general proportions of the neck and the head. And based on that, later on we're gonna work on the on the rest of the body. And uh, yeah, so Artful Nerd, what's up, man? All good, all good. My little glove here. Getting hot over here in Mexico. I mean, we had a couple of cold days, but then we get some really hot days. And it sucks. Okay. Now, I normally don't like working with perspective here inside of Seabrush. Um, there are some people that say that they like perspective, and what they do is they go to the draw options, and they change the focal length to something a little bit bigger, like 177 or something. I mean, it's fine. It really doesn't change that much, but I do recommend not using the default 50 because it's very very like it gives you a lot of distortion and things do change quite a bit if you use that one um yeah exactly rafa i, I think that the ones from game of thrones are more reminiscent of real life animals and therefore people find them a little bit more easy to believe maybe i'm a bit confused will the portfolio review uploaded on march 22 i will review it on march 22 dark magician so make sure to submit on the discord channel before that uh, date so that you don't miss the opportunity so here the first thing we need to do is of course generate the basic shape of the element and um, i i went back this uh, i was gonna record a little story for instagram but i forgot i went back this week to university to, to teach i've been teaching online for a couple of months now but they asked me to to go back and, and cover for a class and um and one of the things that i was telling that group they're they're going through seabrush was that Silhouette is the most important thing of, or one of the most important things in the in the beginning stages of your like production, right? The production of any type of uh, character or, or creature. And usually, when you're starting any sculpt inside the sea brush, you want to work with big brushes first. 
A very common mistake that I see people make when they're sculpting in ZBrush is they want to jump straight into Damien Standard and uh, and the wrinkles and the details and things like that. When when this basic silhouette is more and more important, like way more more important at this beginning stage. I know there are some artists that, that sculpt with very high resolution levels. This workflow is the one that I personally prefer because it gives me a little bit more control. And of course, as you get better and better, you get more experience, you guys are also gonna find which one works best for you. But I feel that this one is a little bit more safe. It gives you more, again, more control over the whole thing. And it allows for a more precise workflow. What tablet am I using? I'm using the Huion Canvas Pro 13 inch. It's a 2.5K version. There's also a, a review there on the channel in case you wanna check it out. I've been using Huion for the past couple of years and um, it's been great. I haven't had any, any issue whatsoever. There's sometimes some issues with the drivers, but they are usually like quite fast in, in figuring and, and fixing them out. Let's add now where the mouth is gonna be roughly. There we go. Oh, that looks cool. We're just starting and this already looks quite cool. You should make a demon and string. I I've made so many demons. I'm actually tired of doing demons. I did the demon character, the, the only course, the Seabrush course. So if you guys want to learn Seabrush from scratch, that's a great course to start with. And we do a demon, an Oni character. And um, I did a demon a couple years ago for another, another company. I worked on the Diablo commercial that I mentioned a couple years ago, so I've done a lot of demons. We're gonna do dragons now. No, see, one of the things that I want to do is I want to do an alien. I haven't done aliens in a while. Like Star Wars alien sort of stuff, right? There we go. Now, here's an interesting and maybe um, controversial take that I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna add the neck, but I'm gonna add it as a separate uh, mesh. Why? Because I want to have control over the over the silhouette. Later on, we're going to merge everything. But by adding the the neck as a separate mesh, I should have a little bit more control. Ah, it's not symmetrical. I forgot to turn on uh, symmetry. There we go. I'm going to have a little bit more control. Uh, I don't like cyborgs. That's the thing. I... I we all have like things that we like and we don't like, right? And and to me, sci-fi, I always prefer like Star Wars sci-fi, where it's this sort of like grungy, again, kind of medieval fantasy, right? Or, or medieval uh, sci-fi than um, than true sci-fi. Like Star Trek, I could never get into Star Trek. And I'm not saying it's a bad show or anything. It's just like it's not my my cup of tea. I I prefer. Again, grungy look and yeah, yeah, like like fantasy style stuff, but that's not super technological. I, I think technology, like when when technology gets involved, I kind of like, I don't know, I I don't feel as connected to the story. Do you look at the screen of the tablet <laughs> in this one? Since I'm I'm streaming and I need to look at the camera, I'm actually looking at my screen, like my main screen right here. The tablet screen is down here, but I feel like if I do this, the microphone's gonna be very far away. So that's why I'm looking straight at the screen. But yeah, sometimes like when I'm not uh, uh, what's the word? When I'm not uh, streaming, I normally uh, look at the at the tablet, like at, at the pen display. If you plan to break this dragon, should the job be sculpted separate from the top of the skull of the creature? Um, no, no, you should actually you actually do the same thing here. The only the only thing that you might need to do is open the mouth a little bit. So so you're gonna keep the mouth like relatively open. I think we had a couple of concepts here. Where's Beer? Oh, well, it's in one of the concepts, but yeah, you, you keep it open so that the rigor can close it. Generally, did you just pull the neck from the head? Yeah, yeah. Generally, I just I just pulled the head, the, the neck from the head. And in this case. Just to get a little bit more control. Especially on the next curvature, because this next curvature is where, where it gets tricky with dragons. Because you have like this very long neck that connects to the to like the torso. So again, right now it's gonna be just like a bust. But this connection is kind of like an S shape. There you go. You can see that every single dragon has this sort of like S shaped neck. Now this one has like chunky neck. But even the chunky neck, like this one right here, you can see that uh but there's gonna be a little bit of curvature. Of course, like this one, right? So so that's why I, I wanted to control the neck as a, as a separate piece. Because we're gonna have this, this thing going back and then towards the front. 
So it's this this sort of direction right here. Right, that's it as it enters the the chest area. And then in the chest area, here's where it's going to kind of like puff out right there. And again, later on, we're going to have like the whole body and everything, the wings and all that stuff. So I want to focus on this part right now. Dark Souls Ancient Dragon. Let's take a look at that. Dark Souls 2 Ancient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good reference. He does look a little bit more like an iwana though see how he's standing right there he's kind of like doing this that's more like an iwana pose lord rokyo what's up man welcome and the, and i want this one to be more like a lion so so that's the thing about uh dragons right like they they can be very very different some of them are oh sorry Shit. It's allergy season, so I'm gonna be sneezing quite a bit. I apologize in advance. Um, but yeah, some dragons are more like um, like lizards. Some are more like vampires. Some are more like uh, like T-Rexes or dinosaurs. So it depends quite a bit on the on the design, right? There we go. So as you can see, very straight line here. Definitely like a bearded dragon. Yeah, right? Like the Dark Souls one? Yeah. And that's great because if you take inspiration from the real world, then it's a lot easier. Okay, cool. So uh, following one of the questions that we just got about the, the jaw, this is very important. If you are going to have a character and you are going to rig him and, and do all that stuff, then it is important to have the, the mouth open. And there's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, for this one in particular, I think I'm just going to do it the old school way, which is just sculpting. So I'm going to increase the resolution quite a bit. And then I'm literally just going to start sculpting and dynameshing, sculpting and dynameshing, sculpting. You can also use light booleans. You can use clay brushes. I'm just showing you one of the, again, the old school methods. Here I'm going to use trimming dynamic, dynamesh. And now that we have a good, a good like hole right there, I'm just gonna push it back. I know I'm destroying the the eyes. Don't worry. So we're just gonna push this. We can even just like erase them for now. There we go. And now, very importantly, I'm gonna mask this with mask lasso, and I'm gonna rotate it down a little bit, so that we have a little bit more working area. Later on, I'm gonna do the test of how it closes. But, um, but this is pretty much the, the way that we're going to do it. What's the shortcut you're doing for Dynamesh? Just control and drag outside of the object when when any masking brush is selected. And that will refresh the, the Dynamesh. Yeah, Deadwing was definitely one of the of the big, um, of the big uh, influences for this dragon. But this is a good dragon. Story-wise, this is going to be a, a good dragon. Don't you feel fear when the model starts to look good that it may become bad? Yes. But I also trust the process, uh, Aki. So I know that if I follow the the things that I teach, primary forms, secondary forms, tertiary forms, then things are going to work fine at the end. So now is the moment, as you can see right here, where we have a good base, right? This is the, the very basic like shape of our element. We have a good, um, yeah, like a good shape in general. And, and I want to start adding a little bit more detail on the, on the silhouette and the bones of the character. And this is where we can use a little bit of comparative anatomy. So I'm going to show you this, um, this artist. Her name is Terry Whitlash. Whitlash. There we go. She's an illustrator. She's a concept artist. She works very closely with James Cameron for the Avatar films. And, um, and she is amazing. She knows a lot about creature design. And she creates this very, like, unique, magical-looking creatures with a lot, a lot of anatomy, like, background, right? So so all of the creatures that she creates are based and, and built upon, like, real-world anatomy. I have one of her books. I have this one. It should be, like, back here. And, um, and one of the things that I see her do quite a bit is this sort of, like, creatures again. And she does a lot of comparative anatomy, right? Where she compares the anatomy of whatever animal she is trying to create with something that's close to it. So, for instance, this one right here, of course, there's a little bit of a triceratops right there. And there's, like, a cheetah and maybe, like, a little bit of a lemur or something. And she uses that, like, again, bone, muscle, and fat information 
to generate a very believable, very realistic looking animal. So if we look at like the skull of a T-Rex, which of course I think is a very close animal to a, um, what's the word, to our dragons right here, you're gonna see that T-Rexes have a lot of hollow spaces, right? And this is a very common thing, very design, very common design thing in, in a lot of like big animals. Since you have a very big skull, it cannot be all solid because otherwise it would be very difficult to, to carry, right? So there's gonna be a lot of empty space, a lot of air, if you wish. And all of those areas where there's a lot of empty space, you're gonna see things cave in a little bit. And this is a perfect example. I'm actually gonna grab this one right here. So let's get this into our into our pure folder. Because again, one of the things that you're gonna see here is that there's gonna be cavities in several parts of the element, and those cavities are gonna were, were gonna ah, those cavities are what are gonna make very they're gonna create very interesting shapes on our character. So right now you can see we don't have any of those things. So let's start pushing. So for instance, the eyes, I'm gonna push the eyes a little bit closer to the center. We also have our zygomatic arch, which is this one. I'm, I'm not sure if it's still called zygomatic arch, but we're gonna have a big sort of like cheekbone right here beneath the eye. This is very common, again, the sign process, like pretty much every animal right below the, the eyes, there's gonna be kind of like a zygomatic process right there. The nose, there's gonna be a depression here on the nose. And that's the thing that a lot of times, like, and I'm not saying uh, there's anything wrong with this concept. I'm just saying that in 2D art, it's very difficult to see these 3D volumes. And that's what separates us 3D artists from 2D artists sometimes, that we need to understand shapes in three dimensions, right? So, so we need to understand not only length and width, but also depth of the objects to generate something uh, interesting. So for instance, here we're gonna have, of course, the eyebrows. And then I can see like a big hollow area right here. So I'm just gonna carve a little bit right there. And this again, hollow areas are very, very, very cool to generate the visual interest in our in our creatures. Same on the cheekbones here. Well, the jaw is usually a very strong bone. You can see it right here. Like the jaw is very solid, like very, very, very solid. So you're not gonna see too many holes. So, so we gotta keep that into account as well. But that's, like, all of these things that I just said, my friends, and hopefully I didn't, like, made this way too boring. But these are the things that, where I think AI is, is going to take a while to understand. Because it might be able to replicate this, but it's not the same thing as, uh, as understanding what we're doing and why we're making uh, the decisions that we're going to be making. Now, um, a technique that some people like to use, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of it, to be honest, but some people find it useful, is the écorché technique, where they would build or create the skull of the character first, and once they have the skull of the character kind of like defined, they start filling it with muscles and things like that. I mean, it can work. I'm not saying it's not, it's not valid. Uh, I'm just saying that I personally don't uh, find it as useful. Now, I think he has ridges here on the, on the center as well. So, so right around there, changing the silhouette a little bit. You can see all of those spikes. So those are going to be bony protrusions, right? Whenever you have a, a horn, a spike or something, it needs to be anchored to some other uh, bone. Like you cannot have a spike or a horn just like stuck to the muscle. That does not make sense. It always has to be, um, it always has to be anchored to a, a piece of uh, a piece of bone. Otherwise, it's going to be flimsy and it's going to break. They did that, the yeah, crochet, yeah. And they need to do, <coughs> sorry. They need to do that for big productions because you're gonna be using uh, softwares like SIVA, which is the, the muscle deformation system um, to deform everything exactly as, as it would in real world. And therefore, yeah, they need to have like the exact muscles, the exact everything. Now, I'm gonna start doing just very basic teeth right here. So as you can see, he has like two big fangs right there. He's got two ones right here. And a, a secret, well, it's not a secret, but a, a, a detail that you need to keep in, in consideration when, when doing any type of animal is if you do things very exaggerated, it looks cartoonish, okay? So you're going to start looking cartoonish, you're going to start looking stylized. So we're going to keep things a lot more realistic and therefore elements, like the eye, for instance, if I keep this big eye right there, which is a very common mistake, right? Well, not a mistake, but very common decision that some might make. It's like, oh, I like that hole right there. I'm just going to grab this sphere and I'm gonna make the sphere really, really small here on the eye. And if you do that, the problem is that this eye right now is gonna look very big. Like it's a huge eye, right? 
And even if I eye the eyelids and everything, it's a huge eye. It's going to look very cartoonish. It's going to look more like a video game. And I want this to look a little bit more realistic. Therefore, what we need to do is make the eye smaller. Okay. Smaller eyes are a little bit more realistic. I'm going to keep it right here. Now, here's another design principle. And that's why you guys are going to be better artists than people who are not watching this stream. Because you're going to be learning. If you take a look at Predators, right? Not those predators. <laughs> Not that type of predator. Like a lion, right? A lion, a tiger, us as humans. All of the predators in the animal kingdom, we have eyes looking forward because we're hunting. We're looking for the prey. We're looking for where the animal is going to be. So dragons, in this case, are this sort of like weird effect because um, like snakes, right? Snakes are are predators. They also have the eyes looking forward, but they're also kind of like on a side view of things, right? And and that's the difference with prey. So if you look, for instance, at a sheep, yes, the sheep's gonna be looking forward as well. Like every animal is gonna be looking relatively forward, but most of these animals are gonna have the eyes more to the sides, like antelopes, sheep, deer, because they need to be aware of their surroundings. So that's another sort of like decision that we can make here on our on the design of our character to give him the sort of like predator vibes. Robin Mac Mac oh my god that's a difficult one. Macrachan Hey Abe, I recently graduated. I'm struggling to find a job in 3D and thinking of switching careers. You gave me a really positive portfolio review, so I don't know what to do. Oh yeah man, right now and I've mentioned this before, the industry is in a crisis. Like we cannot deny that there's a lot of uh, some people say it's a correction where where they're correcting from from COVID where they overhired and now things are shrinking. But I'm going to give you a very honest uh, opinion about this. I think the problem is that executives and big studios are realizing that they cannot just throw money at the game and make it successful. And, and it's going to take a while, a couple of months, maybe a couple of years for people to understand that a good game, a good product, a good film needs time, needs care, needs good talent, of course, to be a successful product. Because it's not just money. It's not just about creating like pretty looking assets and pretty looking effects. It's a, There's a lot of other things that people forgot to consider. And that's why the industry right now, it's a little bit in a crisis. So here's what I'm going to tell you, my friend. If you can't find a job and you need a job to sustain yourself, right, to pay rent, to pay your bills, there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking a side job or a main job that's going to be your main job for a couple of months while you keep working and looking for a 3d job or for an opportunity in the 3d world there's a lot of people that do that i do that i have sometimes done things that have nothing to do with 3d i do translations like english to spanish translations i do video recording uh editing stuff like that that has nothing to do with 3d sometimes to pay the bills and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that and you keep working on your craft and then if the opportunity arises you make the jump so so don't think that just because you're not working right now on the 3D industry, you're not improving or you're not getting better. Did my servers just crash? No, Ajana, I have not tried Siva because I don't do a lot of rigging. I mean, I, I know rigging. I've taught rigging. I teach rigging every now and then, at least the basics of it. But it's not something that I do as part of my main... Um, as part of my main effect. The horror? What's the horror? Like not finding a job on the on the 3D industry. Also, another advice, and this is not only for Robin, it's for everyone. Guys, there's a lot of other opportunities, 3D related opportunities in other film in other areas. Like I have a couple of students that right now are doing VR experiences for the manufacturing industry, like safety games and safety guidelines that they need to follow when producing car pieces and stuff like that. Of course, it's not the next Halo, right? But they're still using 3D. They're still using Unreal Engine. They're still using virtual reality. So things like that. 3D printing is another big market. Um, what else? Um, architectural visualization or renders is another big market. Product placement. So there are other options my my advice has always been keep your mind open for all of those things and and here's another one robin and and you might be in a fortunate situation where you can actually do this uh, i don't know your your life experience or your life situation but i know there's a lot of people for instance that um are still living with their parents which is perfectly fine i live with my parents until i was 26 so there's no reason to move out if you don't have to. Of course, as long as you help them and support them as well. But the thing is, if you have the option to say, hey, 
I got maybe two or three months left before I really need to get a job and, and start paying the bills, right? I maybe have something saved up. You might want to try doing your own stuff, like maybe create a model and sell it online. Maybe, I don't know, um, go to a local, like offer your services as your own little like studio right it's just you and your studio but you could go to a local shop and be like hey i saw your socials what if we did some collaboration i'm gonna do some 3d animations for you and um and then we work on a commission base that's a little bit more on the entrepreneurial side of things right but i know some people have found a very good success on those sort of stuff as well there we go so that eye as you can see guys now, that eye is looking very, very nice. Let's grab a little bit of space here. Now, all of those spikes that I'm seeing there, I'm going to have to decide whether I'm going to do this as, as insert meshes or if I'm going to be, um, what's the word? Or if I'm going to be sculpting them, like manually here. Maybe with, I, I think sculpting is probably going to be the best one. Now, one thing that I'm definitely seeing here is that he's very straight. So I'm going to push the jawline out. That's also going to give him a, a way sharper, more aggressive sort of look. Train dynamic here. And yes, Lord Tellum says, a job is a job, guys. Every job is, is honorable and valuable. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. There's a guy named Lord of the Print. Yep, yep, that's right. That's right, yep. There's a, like the one I follow, I'm subscribed to his Patreon. His name is Andrea Tarabella. I think he's Italian and he goes by the name Artisan, Artisan Guild. And he also does like uh, miniatures for D&D. For &D. And that's his full-time job. He's doing miniatures and he sells them every month on his Patreon. Yeah, courses are doing great. If you guys haven't seen, we released the last one last week or two weeks ago. That's the um, that was the substance painter course, and I'm working on the on the retopology course right now. Uh, Sarn here is gonna link the the side real quick for all of you newcomers that are here new to the channel. If you want to learn a little more about this in a more structured way, not as free flow as as, as this stream, then uh, the courses might be the best place to go. Topocon course next week. It's probably gonna be ready next week. It's a short course, so so it's not gonna take me long. I'm already in chapter. I'm, I think I'm starting chapter three, so so I'm. It's probably gonna be next week. There's just one variable that I'm uh, I'm dealing with right now. So if if I need to make a small trip that I really don't want to make right now, that might delay things a little bit. But yeah, substance designer. Oh, I don't I don't use substance designer. I'm not the best guy. There's there's some really sick artists on ArtStation that can probably teach you uh, Substance designer, designer better than I can. There you go. Sarn just linked the, the newest course. That's the Substance Painter course. We do see a little bit of Substance Sampler on the other one. Hakan says, I learned about Maya thanks to you, my friend. Thanks a lot. Now I prepare a case after a job interview. There you go. Real-time fetters. Rashid, there's a couple of ways to do it. My advice is use a plugin such as Ornatrix. It's a paid plugin, unfortunately, but it's really, really good. Ornatrix or Jetty, maybe even Xgen, although I haven't done feathers with Xgen. Ornatrix and and um, and Yeti, they have presets for 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 feathers. Now we have a decision to make here, guys, and tell me what you think. We need to do the horns, this big horns right here. I think they should be separated. I know some dragons kind of like blend their horns in, but I think that one should be like a separate mesh. Like the transition is going to be a smooth transition, but I think it has to be a, a separated mesh. What do you guys think? How many hours were you spending a day on 3D just before becoming a professional? Oh, like, like when I was a student, I spent like 10 hours every day. For three years doing 3D. I went to Noman. You guys, you guys know that. I, I went to Noman um, three years. It was a certificate program. And when I was there, since I traveled all the way, I'm from Mexico, so I traveled there. I had no friends, very little family over there. So my full focus was um, <laughs> was studying, and therefore I was able to literally be there from 9 a.m. when the school opened, all the way to 1 a.m. when the school closed. 
a very good friend of my, mine. His name is Mark. He's currently working at 2K in Ireland. Um, he he used to drive me home in the night after we finished working on our stuff. I think he and me were like two of the most hardworking guys there. Like we would spend literally every minute we could at, at school. But yeah, as Mr. J say, I, I didn't count the hours. I counted the projects. I counted the, the things that I was doing. Like, that's the important part. I'm going to keep them together. Because there's going to be a lot of geometry anyway. Because of the... Because of the scales and stuff. So, I don't think we're going to have that much of an issue. And I, I really want to see them blend nicely. What do you think is a good daily practice for Seabrush? Um, I would say try to do at least one hour. If you can. Two would be even better, of course. But one hour, I think everyone should be able, especially if you're in the learning stages, one hour should be a good amount of, uh, of practice time. For any software, by the way. Like, if you can do one hour of Maya, one hour of Seabrush, depending on what you're, what you're learning at that particular point, right? I think the horns are a little bit small. This is an issue that I have very, like, this is my own issue. I make things way too small sometimes. So let's fix them there a little bit. Because big horns also mean means a big guy, right? So we of course need to fix all of that. Like, oh, okay. This is a very common mistake, right? You do this and then you get boom, this freaking matrix glitch or whatever. Just go all the way here to geometry, modify topology, and then um, there's one called close holes. And we use that one. And then when we dynamesh, as you can see, it works way, way better. So that happens when you have some sort of like negative space or negative areas. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty simple. Just, just fix those holes and, and you're good to go again. There we go. I like the silhouette quite a bit. And we're going to have a little bit of a spike here as well. Hey, if there's a lot of discussion regarding AI and how AI is going to replace artists. I know you must be getting these kind of questions a lot. Yes. Quite a bit. <laughs> As a person who's learning 3D and trying to get into the industry. Um, so, uh, as I've mentioned before, AI is definitely going to change things up. It's definitely going to... What's the word? It's definitely... Yeah, the inflate brushes is great as well, Hudson. Um, AI is, is going to change the game, if you wish. But as long as your skills and your craft are good, the thing with AI is that... It, or rather, the thing with the type of work that we do is that our type or our line of work is very change driven, right? So there's a lot of changes and a lot of requests and things like that. So it's not like you can generate one prompt or one element that's just going to be perfect. So either you're going to be fixing a lot of things that AI creates and, and therefore AI becomes kind of like the first step for some of the pipelines, or you're just going to do it from scratch. You're going to use AI as a reference, as an idea, and then you're going to use that uh, or you're going to do it from, from scratch. Let me use the snake hook here. I'm going to use the snake hook just to give myself a little bit of an idea of, of how the spikes are going to look. What's my favorite software? I think the music's a little bit high, isn't it? The song went a little bit higher. There we go. Um... Bum, 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 bum. I want AI to do my Retopo. I love Retopo. See, that's one of the things that I don't... I mean, I, I guess some Retopo might be a good idea for AI, but um, I, I actually enjoy doing Retopo. <laughs> I, I like it. Uh, what's my favorite software? I would say ZBrush. I definitely enjoy ZBrush the most. And Substance. I really like Substance. Did you guys see what I did with the Dwarf on the, on the course? Like, I was really happy with the, with the result there. Okay, so I think we're getting a little bit too high here on the nose. So we're going to have to to do some changes to accelerate the nose. And here is where we can try something. So um, at least again, for this beginning stages, since we're working with the character in a way that's very modular, we can split the jaw. So I'm going to select this jaw right here. I'm going to press Control W to, to create a polygroup. So now we have two polygroups. The upper part and lower part and we can go sub tool just do a split a group split okay 
And the reason why I want to do this is so that we can grab the jaw again and just close it and get the proper shape. So, for instance, here I can already tell that these teeth are not exactly where they need to be. So, I'm going to start kind of like, like moving them again. And I'm going to move the shape of the jaw because the character should look like the concept when the jaw is closed. So, I'm going to keep this jaw separated like this. For now, so that we can work on the on the proper again proportions of the, of the dragon. He's supposed to have a little bit of an underbite, just a little bit. You can see that he's got a couple of small teeth here as well, going towards the top. And later on, when we need to to re like weld everything together, we're gonna be able to do that. How much am I hindering myself by using a mouse in ZBrush versus a drawing tablet? If you're using a mouse with ZBrush, it's pretty much like if you were trying to draw a a like a pencil drawing or a pencil like piece with a brick. So you are hindering yourself a lot, like a lot, a lot, a lot. Can it be done? Yes, it can definitely be done. I've seen some people that do again amazing things with just a mouse. However, do yourself a favor, save a little bit of money if you're if you're having some issues there. And get yourself a tablet if you want to really like create like cool stuff here with ZBrush, because you you definitely need uh, you definitely need a tablet. Yeah, exactly. I, I sometimes use the mouse for for C modeler when it's more like traditionally modeling, but even then I'll, I'll just I'll just reduce the draw size to one and and use my um, my stylus. But yeah, you definitely want to. You definitely want to see if, if it's possible to, to get a tablet. I've been using this Hoyon once, again, since a couple years. And when people ask me which one do I recommend for the price and, and the quality, I think Hoyon is really good. Wacom is supposed to be the best because everyone in the industry uses Wacom. Uh, but the thing is, Wacom is very expensive. So it's, it's uh, I, I like to compare it kind of like Android and Apple. I know there's a lot of people who love um, who love uh, Apple and iPhones and stuff like that. I've never used a, uh, I've never had an iPhone. I've always been an Android Android guy, but for instance, I do accept that iPad wise or in tablets, iPads just like freaking win. So Huion is like the Android of, of tablets, I would say. I start looking too small. That's the point. I want small eyes. I want small eyes, and the reason why I want small eyes, uh, Solid Mango. It's because I want him to look more realistic. So if we have small eyes, then when you see him as a character right here, it's going to look like a freaking big dragon. If you see uh, big eyes, then it's going to look like a small dragon. So that's why also the size of the eyes is, is very important. And you see that in like the new Godzilla movies. Like the eyes from Godzilla, very small. Because he's huge. Himanshu, I'm doing great, man. I am doing great. Now, here what I'm doing, guys, um, I know I, I haven't been talking a lot about the process, but I'm doing a lot of cleanup. So I'm using clay buildup to build up form, and then I'm using trim dynamic to clean up that form. That way, I'm not uh, generating the sort of like mashed up clay, and it starts looking, you know, a little bit cleaner. Because all of this base, I always like to use the analogy of the of the cake, right? So if you're, if you're baking a cake, you can have the most amazing, prettiest looking, like... Uh, uh, fondant and uh, and decoration, but if the base, if the if the bread of the cake sucks, then it doesn't matter how how amazing your your decoration is. No one's gonna no one's gonna want to to taste your cake. So so that's what I'm doing right here. I'm I'm cleaning the form because on top of this form is where all of the scales and all of those elements are gonna be located. Now, uh, when I was starting, everyone told me that all my characters looked angry. So now I try to do them in more of a balanced uh, stance. I know the concept is a little bit angry, so I could just very easily push this down like that. He's going to be angry. But it's a little bit easier if we keep it in a more neutral pose, neutral stance. And then later on in rigging, you, of course, like make him angry. <laughs> my kicks are as bad as my 3D. <laughs> there we go. Now here, let's extract the teeth because I think I think having the teeth as separate elements is gonna be better. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a very quick carve here. These are like four of the main teeth. 
on the front here, I definitely want some teeth as well, but I'm going to do them as a, as a separate element. You're going to see how in just a second. So here's a, here's a trick. What I'm going to do is I'm going to mask out with mask pen. I'm going to mask out the teeth. And even if I take a little bit more, that's fine. This is very, very rough sketching still. So we're going to grab all of the teeth right here. That. There we go. And we're going to press Control W again. It's going to give us another uh, poly group. Then let's select that guy. Invert, Control W so that all of this is a single poly group uh, uh, again. And then just a split. Just split. Hit OK. This one is going to become the sort of like the gums, right? So as you can see, we have the exact same shape. And this ones are going to become the, the teeth. So now it's just a matter of doing some cleanup where we're going to have a, a very, again, clean base for the for the teeth. And that's going to allow me to do two things, very important things. It's going to allow me to add a little bit of form around the teeth, which is where the teeth is kind of like inserting itself on the, on the like a mandible on the jaw. And that's going to give me an, a more interesting silhouette. Again, we're going to have to to modify and clean up the, the teeth, but at least uh, in my experience, art directors love when you can show them this. Like if someone tells me, start working on this dragon, and I show them this by the end of the day, they're going to be like, okay, cool, now make this change, this change, this change, modify this, modify that, because it's easier than, than if I just focus on, for instance, on the eyes, and I do like a perfectly like finished eyes. It's not gonna, it's not gonna work. Are you going to rig this dragon? I'm not sure through the docs, but most probably yes, because I do want to pose him. So we'll see where this project goes. Sharpen the nose there a little bit. Make it kind of like a like a horn. There was a brush. I don't use this brush quite a bit, but there's a brush that kind of like creates like these are like tongue looking shapes. I mean, we can just use spectral displacement. So this is a very cool brush. Uh, if we go here to Shisel Creature, we're gonna have this one scale one. And this one's very good to, to generate like the scales. So you can see that we have a lot of like small scales right there. And, and there's a new type of brush. Well, that's not new, but they added this a couple of versions ago, which is this drag stamp. So you drag it and then you you modify how how intense you want the the element to be. So the size of the brush is gonna determine the size of the scale. And then you you kind of like push it or, or push it in or out depending on on how how intense you want that that effect, right? That's a it's a relatively easy way to to add this detail and vector displacements as we know they they push things up and down, so they're gonna allow me to to generate that change in silhouette, which is exactly what we're seeing there. And I'm not saying these are gonna be the final um, what's the word? These are gonna be the final scales. Like I might do a different scales later on. But at least as a as a little like idea of how things are looking, it's a good it's a good way to again to show this to like an art director and be like, hey, do you like the direction of this character right here? Can BDM maps be exported as PNGs? Yes, you can grab this one right here, like this alpha, and export it as a as a as a PNG. Yeah, yeah, you should be able to. I mean, it's a texture at the end of the day. The only difference with this BDM maps is that they are built on top. I think, do we have a BDM video on YouTube, Sarn? I believe I did one not too long ago. Yeah, I did one. It's like, a, there's like a rock troll and I show how to do your own BDM. So you might, you might want to check that one out. I mean, it's for displacement because they, they displace the geometry, but that doesn't mean that you can t use them for, for modeling, like, like here, for instance. So as you can see here, I can very easily just start displacing the geometry to get an idea. Again, these are not gonna be probably not gonna be the final, the final meshes of my of my element, but that doesn't mean that we can't use them. And it's already changing the the silhouette of the dragon and giving us a better idea of how the character is gonna look. Remember that that's the main sort of um, the main idea behind these early stages of, of any any creature that we do we want to make sure that whoever is 
seeing this, our client, our art director, the audience even, there are some studios that like to share updates with their with their audience and they'll they'll give feedback on, on what they think looks good or not. So we want them to to see the idea behind this whole thing. Do we top of this guy is going to be a task? Not with Topogon. Topogon is really fast. I've been using it quite a bit lately and it's uh, really really impressive how how fast you can work. And a lot of the, that's why I'm also separating the teeth because if you separate the teeth, it's very easy to to retopologize. You didn't even need like clean topology. You can just be very basic uh, C remesher because those elements are not gonna deform. They're gonna move, but they're not gonna deform. They're always gonna be like a solid object, right? So you can keep them as uh, as a solid object. Now here's very important. We we do want to create a little hollow area of where this teeth is kind of like like pushing against the the jaw right there. It's a little bit more of a tertiary detail, but it's very, very important to, to keep into account. Can you show in sofa patterns how to do in Maya? Uh, nowadays, uh, Palakurti, most of those things we would probably do with texture. Like, it, it really makes no sense to model that when you can displace it. So there are textures inside of um, Substance Share and Substance 3D Assets and things like that that you could use to to generate that effect. Also, it's it's sometimes easier to sculpt those sort of details inside of ZBrush. And, and that's one of the important things about, um, it's one of the important things about the, the 3D world. You need to understand that there are tools specifically made for specific things. So when people tell me, hey, show me how to do cloth inside of Maya with, with end cloth, right? We don't use end cloth anymore. If you're working on a big production and you have the budget, to, to buy a couple of licenses or rent a couple of licenses, you're going to be doing your simulation instead of Marvel's Designer, right? Because it, it makes just no sense to use an inferior tool when there are way better tools out there. So you got to be very, very mindful of uh, of where you, you do that. First, what's up, man? Nice to see you again. What do you mean nice to see me again, dude? I've been here every Friday. Or did you miss me from from other places? Because I've been here for the past couple of months, man. I've not gone anywhere. Some people think I stopped YouTube because I stopped working on the other channel. But no, I'm here. Here we go. Solid Mango says, I wanted to buy the Substance course, but I want to learn Retopology, so I'm waiting for that course. Yeah gonna be out very soon i promise we got some cool surprises with that as well i'm creating a little bit of a concave area there because that's the area that's gonna be attached now we should save because i have not saved and if this crashes right now i'm gonna be very sad I always like to save versions, so this is going to be 001. The Substance course goes much more in-depth in Substance compared to the Blender. Yes, like way more, my friend. Like way, 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 way more. In the sub in the Blender course, I just like barely grasped like the basic surface of the whole thing because it just, it, it was a Blender course rather than a Substance course. <laughs> it was funny. We actually got a hater. Oh, you guys don't know how much a, a review can affect us, but we got a hater on, on Udemy that gave us one star review on the Blender course because he said that he found it uh, very, what was his wording? He said like, it's very dishonest. He said it's very dishonest that they sell this course when they tell you it's a Blender course and you're gonna be using Substance. And the interesting thing is on the description of the course and on the intro video, I do mention that we're gonna be using Substance. So it was not hitting anywhere, but that one star review brings the whole average down so much. So, so much. Yeah, that was it. I didn't know you had created your own channel, so I was waiting for new content there. I discovered your channel last week. Oh, there you go first. Yeah, I, I, I uploaded a video on the other channel explaining my exit and, and, um, and what was happening, but they took it down. So, unfortunately, a lot of people 
still haven't found the new channel or the new Discord. If you're not on the Discord first, make sure to join as well. So, yeah. How do the pros make hyper-realistic eyes? What program do they use and what's the workflow? You mean, uh, well, it, it's mostly rendering. So it mostly has to do with rendering, but you can sculpt like the iris and the and the retina and everything here inside of Seabrush. There's usually displacement map involved. And, and the thing that makes eyes very interesting is the amount of layers that you add to them. So you can have your basic sphere with just like an eye texture and that looks good. You can have your basic eye and then a, a like a layer on top of it that's gonna act as a glass and it's gonna distort it and that looks better. And then you can have the eye, the iris, the inside of the eye, the external element, the eyelid and a couple of extra maps and it's gonna look even better. And then you can have all of that plus displacement maps, plus some subsurface scattering, plus some refraction maps and it's gonna look even better. So it depends a lot on the project on how how big you want to go pretty much and how the budget or the time allows for of course but it's it's usually about that i think did i do an eye tutorial i'm not sure if i did an eye tutorial can you talk about your thought process when doing secondary forms yes of course so when doing secondary forms for instance on this area right like right now this is a very empty area it's just primary forms so i need to think about what's going on in in anatomy wise or when you think about characters creatures and things like that you need to think about okay what forms are there underneath this thing so for instance here on the chin at least in humans right below the the lower lip there's usually going to be a little bit of a hollow space because the chin pushes out and there's a muscle that like moves it so i'm gonna carve in so i'm gonna start removing volume on that area and then to blend in this sort of like lip area, this sort of like underbite with this one right here, I'm just going to taper this with like a little bevel and then add volume. So it's a, a, lot, a lot about blending those areas. And of course, silhouette. So I look at the silhouette and try to find what looks the best. So I know we're going to be missing a couple of teeth right there. So there's going to be like two small teeth right around there. We're going to have the little like push up of the teeth. So I just start like dragging. So secondary form is all about, again, like cylinders, spheres, cubes, and how they push the surface in or out, right? So for instance, here, the teeth, they're going to be pushing the, the form out. So I'm going to add a little bit of volume right there. And once I like that volume, I'm going to clean it up, either define a little bit more or blend it with other volumes. And there's a very cool analogy. I've, uh, I've shown this one before that says that most... Uh, living creatures are made out of water, right? And if you have a pebble and you drop it on a on a surface of water, what's going to happen is the pebble is going to create um, undulations, right? So the pebble is going to go down here. It's going to be undulations, and then more and more and more and more. But there's always going to be a high point and a low point, a high point and a low point, a high point and a low point. It's very, like, you're not really going to get, like, high point and then high point and then low point and then low point like this this does not happen right like this forms do not exist and it's the same thing here so if we're going to have high points here on the teeth then that means that in between the teeth there's probably going to be a little bit of a low point so it will be very weird to have just like two high points uh like one next to the other can you make belts and that kind of yes yes you can actually in the blender course uh in the blender in the marbles course that i have we do a couple of props that way we do gloves, we do a belt, a very simple belt. We do a hat, <laughs> that, that one's a funny one. It's one of the last parts of the process. We do a hat for the, for the character. So yeah. Now here's important, look at the concept. There's a very big problem here with the concept. Well, not with the concept, with my interpretation of the concept. And that is the position of the eye. If we take a look at this, you're gonna see that the eye is way, way, way more far forward than what I have right here. So my distance from the eye to the back of the jaw, it's close. It's not great, but it's close. But the eye, as you can see, should be aligned to this second teeth right here, which is this one, okay? Same thing here, like the size of the teeth, they're not exactly the same. So, so we need to take a look at all of that because those little details are what makes the concept interesting. So for instance, this teeth right here, you can see it's a lot closer to the, to the front teeth. So I'm gonna push the teeth like this. And I'm gonna go to the to the face right here. I'm gonna push the whole face forward so that the eye is pretty much on that second element. And look how much that changes the way that character looks. Right? It's impressive. This is one of those things that not a lot of people like figure out sometimes 
but the the proportion like the distance between one thing and the other changes so much about the character and you need to be very very careful because if there's a concept and you're following a concept well you should follow the concept <laughs> you should you should obey those proportions and those rules because those things that you find cool on the concept will be present on your 3d model another thing for instance that i see right here is that the eyebrow it's a lot lower something like this right and now the character has changed a lot and it was just like we just changed a couple or a bit or yeah just like small little things small little elements in proportions and this is a completely different character and i'm gonna show you let's save this tool let's dragon two and let's open dragon one look at the difference this was dragon one and this is dragon two it might not look like that big of a difference but it is a lot different yes it looks more natural right it looks more like a like an animal so a little bit more realistic i would say this one was still looking a little bit too cartoonish i think because he had like a very long like uh like nose or something so it's it's those small changes that's a little bit difficult to explain why we do them but it has to do as um as Saraf is saying it, it's it's how you do it to make sure that you get those like little unconscious or subconscious things that make people say yeah this looks more natural okay because it follows a little bit closer to the proportions of the real world uh agus yes i have a maya course but it's a really like introduction level maya course so i'm not sure if i'm not sure what level do you have right now if you're just starting with maya then it's a perfect course because we cover a little bit of everything however um it is quite like introduction level um sarn is gonna link my site in just a second there and you can check right now we have five official courses released a maya course a blender course a seabrush course a marvelous designer course and the substance painter course so kind of like the like the most used software so far or, or the ones that we use the most right now so if you want to check them out the, the site's going to be available there in just a second Carla Lopez says, hi, Abe. I know that work visa is really hard to get for Mexicans. Can I ask if you have worked in another country and what was the country? Yeah, I have not worked in another country, but I have worked for teams on other countries. So as a freelance, pretty much. Um, well, yeah, freelance contract work. I, I think it was contract work because I, I did sign the contract and everything. Because freelance, you, you sometimes think it's like, oh, they're just going to send the money and that's it. No, I, I did have a contract and everything. Um, the times that I've worked with studios. So, yeah. I did the Maya course. I showed it to my teacher at Mac. They really liked it. Yeah, there you go. And and I know, I, I guess it's sometimes difficult for me to to list all of the things that I've done. And um, and I don't blame you guys. If you if you have seen my courses, I'm like, who's this guy? Who why why is he teaching and stuff like that? I've taught at universities for the past eight years. So I I, I do know my stuff. <laughs> and I, I got students working in, in top studios and top places. So I can I can guarantee that the things that I teach are are like valid. I'm not just selling you like fumes or whatever. Hello from Russia. There you go. Yeah, the difference is crazy, right? Crazy, crazy. Now I really like this bump that we have right here behind the eye. I'm gonna go here to the jawline and add it. And again, remember later on, what we're going to do is we're going to. We're going to join this back with the head, but we're going to do it in such a way that this is open. But I want to make sure that this is we have the, the closest proportion proportion that we can before I do that. I actually want to add a couple of teeth here. I know that they're not in the concert, or at least they're not as visible, but I kind of want to add some small teeth like there, there. And there and I'll show you how I add teeth in just a second because we're actually gonna be replacing some of them like this one's on the front I really don't like and even that one on the on the back is looking a little bit weird have you I'm a, are you really asking that question have I played monster hunter dude I'm a huge monster hunter fan like huge 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 me and my brother we're like duo we always play together. 
he's way more shit. Oh, he's way more a fan of, of Monster Hunter than I am. He he even has like the hammer tattoo on his on his arm. But uh, yeah, we played like everything. We played Rise. We played Sunbreak. We played. We started playing on on the three E on the was it DS? No, three DS. It was uh, Monster Hunter for Ultimate. That was the first one that we played. And then since then, we pretty much played all of the all of the games. We're <laughs> really happily waiting for uh, Monster Hunter. Um, uh, what's the one they call Wilds? Right, it's the next one. Wilds. I'm gonna tell you a very sad truth about the education system, Solid Mango. Unfortunately, the education system, not everywhere, but in a lot of parts, has become a a sort of like um oh man, I don't, this is a very controversial topic. Hopefully I don't get <laughs> freaking canceled or something. But a lot of schools in the world, and for a lot of careers, not only art, they've become more of a for-profit business. And I'm not saying it shouldn't be for profit. What I'm saying is they're focusing more on the money than on actually teaching the things that they need to teach. So I had an, an issue a couple of years ago with a university where they wanted me to teach the, the students, but they say that in order for me to be able to teach at the university, I needed to have not only a master's, but a doctorate, like PhD. And I told them, guys, we, I mean, yes, you could get a PhD in 3D or something, but it's not really something that we do. It's you just have a cool portfolio, you work on cool projects, and and that's it. And they couldn't really understand it. I was like, no, but how are you gonna prove that you know how to do stuff if you don't have a PhD or a or a or a doctorate or a master's? And I was like, well, with your portfolio, with with the things that you do, right? So, <laughs> so that's why a lot of schools, unfortunately, they they focus too much on the on the credentials. And they don't focus on the actual quality of the job. So I've seen a lot of students uh, come to me from from very high level universities and schools. They're like, I'm paying a lot of money, and the teacher's not teaching me like modern stuff. It's like, no, because they they are still using techniques from like 20 years ago that you don't use anymore. Like, I'm I'm gonna give you an example, and hopefully you don't feel identified with this. But if you guys have ever done this exercise at your university, this. It's ridiculous. It, there's absolutely no need, I would say, right now, for anyone to know how to do a box model of a face. Like, that's what we did. Again, like, when I first learned 3D 14 years ago, they taught me how to do this. But if you're doing this, it's ridiculous. Why would you spend hours and hours, like, moving each vertex when you can so easily go into into ZBrush, sculpt the face, and then retopologize with proper animation topology, right? So, but hey, I mean... There's not much I can do about that. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's just one person against the whole system sometimes, and uh, there's not much, not much you can do there. So Ham says, "Hello, hey, first time joining your live stream. Love the way you explain everything, man. You make it really easy to understand. Ah, thanks, man. I'm glad you like it." Do you play League of Legends? I used to play League of Legends. I used to play support. I played for like four years, I think. My main supports were Braum, Leona, Lux. Uh, who else did I like to use? Braum, Leona. I think that's it. I actually have. I played off a little. I had like a Leona Funko, but I, I don't have it here right now. But it was very toxic, so <laughs> so I don't I don't play anymore. Morgana, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I play. Uh, I, I was a Morgana main just when I started. Like when I first started playing League, I, I used to play Morgana a lot, and then and then they nerfed them or nerfed her, and and I didn't play as much. Let's delete those. Okay, let me show you how I do teeth for this guy. So it's very simple, actually. I'm gonna go to a different element. I'm just gonna grab a sphere. I'm gonna make this a poly mesh 3D. And with my move brush, I'm gonna create the very basic shape of a teeth. Like a fang, right? You can even give it a little bit of a of a sharpness in certain areas. Fangs are way more round than we think they are. This is another very common misconception. Like if you look at crocodile fangs, for instance, who have one of the strongest bite in the in the um, in the world you're gonna see that they're quite round we tend to think about 
teeth that's very sharp but look at that i mean they are sharp i'm not saying they're not sharp but look at this guys they're way way rounder than what we think so dragon crocodile i would say they're quite similar right or they're at least they're sort of like reptile like so that's why i'm not i'm not worrying too much about super pointy elements and another thing is super pointy things are very difficult to bake normal maps for and they're very difficult to displace and things like that so whenever you have just like a one single point uh, it's tricky now i'm gonna go to this view right here i'm gonna say v i'm just gonna create an insert mesh and that's it so by doing that now anytime i need a i'm gonna append a new sphere here that sphere is just like a like a placeholder and now if I need a teeth, I just draw a teeth. That's it. I'm going to draw the teeth. Oh, turn symmetry on. And we just rotate it. And get it into position. So that one's going to be an upper teeth right there. Yeah, right around there. Then we're going to have another one right here. Usually the direction of the teeth is forward, right? Because we want to bite and take a chunk out of whatever it is we're attacking or, or biting. I'm going to modify the, the gum there in just a second. Let's add a couple of these ones right here. In the meantime, let's just say... A becoming worldwide. There you go, Rodrigo. It's true. I'm in the 3D animation class on Invaders, and I've learned a lot. There you go, my friend. Make sure to submit your homework. I'm gonna check it. But yeah, I teach. I teach at university at the university here. That's a, a lot different uh, from the universities that I mentioned before, and that's why I like teaching there because it's um, it, it does understand the the importance of of having people with. Um, What's the word? Wait a second. Am I in the right dragon? No, this is the wrong dragon. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. I was in dragon one. So I already erased this. I was like, what the hell? So yeah, that's why it's, why it's very important to... But I'm going to be very honest, guys. Even... even I, I went to Noman, right? I, I've mentioned this before. And uh, of course, I learned a lot. But I also learned a lot from my own stuff. Like, I, I I graduated in 2016, so that was eight years ago. Do you think I haven't learned more stuff since then? Of course not. I've learned a bunch of stuff since then. So, so it's very important that you also try to find what works best for you in regards to learning. Some people like mentorships. Some people like, um, like a class setting or a class setup. Some people like tutorials. Some people like books. Some people like, um, I don't know. Uh, challenges there's people that really like to to get into contests and that's the way they they learn and they improve so it has to do a lot with with what you find better for yourself okay there's a little bit of a problem in this one but i'm gonna explain how to solve it in just a second the problem is that i'm inserting all of these fangs into the into the jaw the jaw sub tool and ideally, you want to have them separated so that we can modify, like the mar uh, modify them later on. I'm going to explain how to how to do that. No, no, no. I did not uh, participate on the latest one, on the Punisher's one. I did saw it. It was the walking thing, right? Like they're walking on top of a tower. Uh, amazing stuff. And it was a fun. It was a fun prompt. Uh, but I was very busy, like finishing the uh, what was it the um, uh, the substance course so that's why i couldn't participate in that one there we go so let me show you how i would fix the the teeth issue because that's uh, definitely an issue that we need to fix so first of all we need to find where the freaking teeth are so we got some of them here and it seems like we have some of them here okay so here's what i'm gonna do let's isolate let's again check the polygroups and you can see that the teeth have uh separate polygroups so i'm gonna separate this invert control w well oh, careful there Let's actually let's hide the teeth instead. There we go. Control W so that that's a single polygroup. And then control W so that the teeth are a single polygroup. 
and then we split them into a different um into different elements so now we have the top fangs right there that's perfect we're gonna leave top fangs and then bottom fangs and then on this one we have this one and we have this one's right here so this one again i'm gonna do i'm gonna isolate the teeth that we just inserted Control w and then Control w there and we're gonna not duplicate but bad. we're going to group split there we go and then i want to grab i don't know what that is i'm just going to delete it this guy's right here and this guy's right here so i'm going to say merge down there we go so now as you can see we got all of the teeth on the same um on the same element so later on when we move the jawline we're not going to have that much of an issue and the jawline is now separated as well so we can just start working on creating the proper fit right here. Do you do private mentoring? I think I need some class to be able to evolve. I'm still trying. Yes, I, I do private mentoring. I have limited limited spots right now because I cannot <laughs> I cannot book the whole thing um, or the whole week with mentorships. But if you want to learn about the pricing and all that stuff, please message me on Discord, and I'll share the the information with you they're usually one hour mentorships we can do them weekly or bi-weekly you pick a project and i help you along that project with uh with guidance and tips and stuff like that should we add teeth here what do you guys think like i'm thinking about adding some teeth like right there and right here i think we should let's go Well, I kind of like it like a little bit higher up there. So not bad for the first dragon that I've done in a couple of years, right? At least for the amount of time we'll, we'll, uh, we've been working on this for, wait. Yeah, like an hour and a half. What time is it? It's, well, time flies when you're sculpting. There you go. Nida, what's up, man? Welcome. It says, I swear if I would have found you before, I would never join Mac. I would have done one-on-one -on -one sessions. Oh, okay. Well, here's another thing, Solid Mango. There is value to schools, and I'm going to explain why, because that's another that's another thing that people sometimes misinterpret with uh, with what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that you should not study and you should just buy tutorials and, and do that and not go to university or college or whatever. It's, it's more about the fact that some colleges will not give you the information that you need right now and that's where your responsibility is you need to find that information but there's a couple of things that universities do teach you and do give you that's very important first of all connections okay you you will get connections you will get to know teachers you will get to know other students and if you're doing this as a self-taught artist that sometimes is very very difficult to find unless you're very extrovert and you go to the communities online and you post and you share which a lot of people like most of us artists we're not very like that we're very introvert um, you're going to have a little bit of a far, hard time finding opportunities because that's one of the things that, that colleges and schools will give you. Will give you access to, to connections that you will not have otherwise. And another thing is they do teach you responsibility, time management, organization, teamwork. Again, skills, those are soft skills, right? That are a little bit difficult to learn by yourself working on your home. So I'm not saying schools are not valuable. I'm just saying that sometimes, especially in regards to outdated information, you will need to find that information on your own through different sources. That's my that's my conclusion there. Or my opinion, rather. Control W sets a polygroup on what's visible. That is right. That is right, Wurgles. When you press Control W, whatever is visible will get a polygroup. It could be masked, or if you have something that's masked and you polygroup that, you will get a, a polygroup. The hardest part about school is having questions about how to do certain things than being told we'll learn that in a different semester. <laughs> I, I hate those teachers. 
I'm not one of those teachers. Like when people ask me, hey teacher, how do you do this? If it's very, very complex, I'll just give them a, like a little bit of, a, of an insight. Like people ask me, how do you muscle systems? Oh, I, I won't be able to teach you right now, but there's this software called CBIFX. You might want to take a look, you install it into Maya, and there you can generate like something that you're looking close to what you're looking for. But no, I, I, I actually have a very open policy with my students where I tell them, you can ask me anything. As long as it's not like personal life stuff, you can ask me anything about the 3D world. And if I know the answer, I'll tell you. If I don't know the answer, I'll also tell you, hey, I don't know, but here's where I would start looking for. Because questions are the most important thing when, when you're learning. Those are the things that spark the imagination and, and generate or allow you to, to generate... Um, knowledge right to to learn yeah sandra i, I understand and, and that's the thing like 3d has becoming has become bigger and bigger in the world because it's been applied to a lot of industries so there's going to be a lot of people that sometimes they are and here's the thing sometimes it's not the fault of the teacher i got a message not too long ago about the teacher that told me hey i'm taking your 3d maya course because the school where i teach at they are forcing me to teach 3d and i don't know anything about it uh, I mean, forcing might be a, a strong word, right? But they're telling me that they really need someone to teach 3D and they're asking me to do it. So I need to learn and and, and that's it. And of course, I cannot go to that school and teach. It's, it's really not viable. So there's going to be, there's always going to be someone that might be a little bit new to the 3D world. But as long as they put in the time and the effort, anyone can learn and uh, and become great at doing these things. I think schools teach you how to learn new stuff rather than actually teach, teach. Yes, yes, Dark Magician. And I remember I had a conversation on one of my last days at Noman with another uh, fellow Noman student. And, and I told him that. It's like, you know what? I think I get something now. Like, not only did we learn some techniques here at the school, like, again, sculpting, normal app and stuff like that. But we also, I told him, I think I learned more on how to learn. So the next time that I need to learn something, like I'm gonna give you guys an example, a perfect example. Someone on the last stream told me about Gaia software. So Gaia is this 3D software that you can use to generate terrain. Is this this one? No, it's not that one, this one. Yeah, there we go. So this is this is Gaia and it's a, a software that you can use to generate terrain, right? mountain ranges forests and things like that i don't even know like what the price is for this thing but if i if i needed to learn how to use this one i already have a methodology or a workflow that i can follow on on what are the things that i need to look for what are the tools that i need to learn and i know that i can learn the software in at least the basics right in like about two or three weeks and once i know that i can start exploring more and more advanced stuff so, so that is very valuable. And that is something that you learn at school because at least with curriculums, the way they're structured, there has to be some sort of like order so that you can follow them along and, uh, and learn that stuff. So that's why I do think it's, it's valuable. Yep, Jack, I also agree there with you. Connections are super, super important as well. Because connections, and, and that's the thing about the world, guys. Um, and, and you probably have heard this phrase before. It's not about what you know. It's about who you know. It is what you know, because even if you know someone that's very important in the industry or whatever, and you don't have the skills to, to, to rise up to the challenge, then you're going to be wasting that opportunity. But if you, if you know people, it, it does open up more, um, more options. My dad, he has a very, very cool phrase. <laughs> I hated when he told us this phrase when we were younger, but now that I'm older, I'm like, yeah, he was very, that was a very wise phrase. I'm going to try to translate. I've translated it before, but it never kind of explains the whole point. But it, it goes like, the hunter never knows when the hare is going to jump, where the, like, the rabbit's going to jump, right? So you, as the hunter, you are there, like, stalking the prey and getting ready to to shoot when the when the prey shows itself but you don't know when that's going to happen right so for me knowing the right people is being there like if you know the right people you're going to be there where the opportunity arises and that's going to be very cool but then you also need to have the skills to actually shoot and and take that opportunity and nail it like make a freaking amazing impression so that you can get another opportunity 
and so on and so forth, right? So, so it's very, very important that, that you have the skills. It is very important to also get to know the people. So yeah, try to be more social, guys. And I know right now we're in the digital world. Be social online. Comment, like, share stuff. Share your opinion about um, the 3D world, about AI. Like, you never know who's going to be reading you and, and who's going to be asking you and contacting you through an email to tell you, hey, what if we do this? It's like, you know what? That's a great idea. Right, David? Exactly, Jack. If you're very talented, but no one knows you, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there like that. They, they are very good. They're very talented, but they don't like to share their stuff or they're very timid. So it's very important that you that you try to know people. Another big advice that I give people is go in and, and go to the to the comic cons. Go to the to the artist alley and, and meet people like ask them, hey, what do you do? Do you, are you open for commissions? Do you want to collaborate? Like maybe you go to a comic con or to a, a a anime convention or whatever, you find someone that draws very nicely and you really like one of their concepts. And you're a three D artist, and you could be like, "Hey, would you like to collaborate? I'm a three D artist. I, I I saw this piece of yours. It's really cool. I want to do it in three D. And maybe later we could sell a statue as a collaboration, and we split the profits 50 50 You know that kind of stuff. Like there's the there's the sort of stuff. Those are the sort of things that you could try doing to to get your name out there and to generate more leads. Oh, Wergles, that's a that's a huge thing, and, and I'm gonna go full screen because that's a well, that's a great question. So in the 3D world, we always have the technical side of things and the artistic side of things. And f in order for you to be a really proficient 3D artist, you need to try to balance both of those sides. Not only should you know all of the tools and how they work and when to use them, but you also should have the, the artistic and design background of understanding where to use those tools. I, I, when, I was, um, when I was doing my admission, for, for my school, they told me that they didn't want to create a uh, like button monkeys, like people who only know how and where to press buttons. They want to create actual artists that utilize those tools to generate this impactful and important pieces because they know where and when to use these tools. But both of those elements are very important. The technical side of things and the artistic or like the science side of things. So make sure you practice on both of them too, to be a better artist. Sandra says, I'm so glad to catch you live. You've been a huge inspiration to me. Your experience on how to educate and share knowledge truly shines through. So huge thank you. Oh, Sandra, that's very nice. I really appreciate it. And uh, and that's another thing that I don't share very frequently. But it's a, it's a very... What's the word? It's a very... How do I say this? I, I, I think we can all agree with this maybe you guys feel identified with this but we we as as individuals we tend to be very harsh with ourselves very often and and when i decided to be a teacher when i made that like conscious decision of, of hey i know this is not the career that a lot of people might pick but i really want to do it because i enjoy doing it i know i knew there was going to be a lot of like um uh not, not, uh, oh man, I'm having a little bit of a difficult time, like, putting this into words. I knew when I made that decision, there was going to be a lot of people that were going to say things that were not going to be very nice, right? They were going to critique that decision. They were going to say, like, bad things, because usually teaching is not something that is highly praised um, as a society, right? So I knew that I was going to face that. So hearing things like what you just said, it's very encouraging because I know that what I'm doing is, is valuable because I see it in you guys. I see how you guys improve. I've, I've gotten messages from people that are um, getting jobs at the industry, that are improving their portfolio, that they feel more confident about themselves. And I've been doing this for enough years that now I, I can see my, like my Facebook list or Facebook friends and I can see people doing amazing, amazing things. And I feel very happy for them because I've, I've always been that kind of guy. Like I, I 
I, I like competition and I like competing. I like achieving my goals, but never at the expense of others. Like if, if other people are more successful than me, I don't care. I'm happy for them. I'm really genuinely happy for them because it's uh, it's their journey and I'm happy for what they're doing, right? So it's one of those things um, that it's, uh, it's a little bit more of a, of a philosophical decision, I think, that I made when I started teaching that it's difficult to sometimes explain to people because some people are just focused on on success and fame and money and and I see other benefits of, of what I'm doing here like getting to meet you guys and 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 helping others that's the sort of stuff that um I don't know I don't know I'm just rambling right now but it's 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 I'm, I'm really glad to to see through you in this case um Sandra that you see that, I'm, that what I'm doing is valuable because I do feel like what I'm doing is valuable it's just it's difficult sometimes to put it into words. Let's see. Um, can you do videos on 3D scan repair and make them ready to print someday? I'm, I'm not sure what scan repair is, but I'll I'll, uh, I'll do some research. How will, how should we start Seabrush as a beginner? What should we scroll first to have a command on Seabrush? Oh, Nishant, that's a perfect question. Well, you can check my Seabrush course. We start with a skull, a dragon skull, by the way, or a dinosaur skull or something. So skulls are usually like the, the most obvious way to start, like a human skull or like an animal skull. Every time I teach Seabrush, I usually start with the skull because it's a very good way to understand the tools and understand forms, details, and things like that. So I would probably recommend starting with a, with the a skull if possible. And again, you can check my premium course there on the on the site if you want. Do you see Speech Care's videos or lives? I have not, I've seen a couple of his videos. Um, I, I really like his style. He's really good and he's very fast, of course. However, I feel like speed sculpting has a little bit of a toxic side to it because then people think that you should always sculpt at that speed and that's not true when you're in the studio you're not expected to finish a character in two hours like that's not how it works it's better to do it like properly and right even if it takes you a little bit longer so so i don't do a lot of speed sculpting actually that's one of the things that i struggle with uh with you guys <laughs> when i'm when i'm doing like the videos for youtube or the or the series the, the tutorials i always tell you guys this will take more time you're not supposed to finish this in just like three hours or, or two hours. It's going to take some time because it's, it's, um, it just takes time. Art takes time. You cannot rush art. You're going to get way better results if you spend more time on stuff, like efficient time, of course, than if you try to, to rush things. So, so be careful with speed sculpting. It's not bad. It's a good practice. If you want to get fast at the software, like learn the tools, speed sculpting is really good to do that. Let's see, we got one from Marco Castellani. Hi from Brazil. My bad for in my English, don't worry. But um I got your I bought your course and started to make my asks too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've used Seerish before and then you jumped into Blender to do the sculpting, it's a big change. However, I do find it valuable to um, what's the word? I find it valuable to know both tools because sometimes you don't need like if you're doing very basic sculpt inside of Blender for like an asset or something. You can just do it there. It's really not that complicated, and it's gonna speed up your process a little bit. <laughs> so we we're just mentioning. Um, but yeah, most of my sculpt, I would say like 80, 90 percent of my sculpt, I do it here inside of Seabrush. <laughs> Thank you, Ardon. You're one of the few genuine people out there. I try to be, man. I try to be uh, a good man, a good person, a good dad. I have a little kid. She's she's about to be three years old. A good husband, of course. I think that's I think that's our goal in life. Like if, if someone asks me what's your purpose in life, I just try to be better every day in every aspect of my life. And that's it. Might be very um idealistic, but I think that's a good way to live. Where is my Seabrush beginner to expert course? Well the the Seabrush course that I have on my site covers a lot of stuff, man. So I actually I mean it's a beginner course because we start with the basics. But the project is a, it's an ambitious one. Like Diani is is a it's a it's a full character props and everything. So it will teach you a lot of uh, of Seabrush. If you have not started your Seabrush journey, that one's a, that one's a, a quick one. Uh, there's a student on the Discord. You might want to check his stuff. His name is Aaron. He just finished his Oni. Actually, let me show it. Let me show it to you guys. Because if you finish your work and you publish it on the Discord, you get on the Hall of Fame of, as well. This one right here. So this is Aaron. I think he's from Mexico as well. And he he just started, or he just finished his course, his only course. 
And look at his result, like not freaking bad. And he was like a newbie to Seabrush. He knew the very basics, but he took the course to, to polish his stuff. And he did a really, really good result. So if you want to check it out, there you go. You can also go here to the, where is it? Where do we have the Hall of Fame? Notice board? Oh, over here, Hall of Fame. So all of this are the guys who have finished the courses and showed the result here on the forum. We got way more students, but not everyone is here on the Discord channel. So, so yeah. What do you think about Nomad Sculpt? Ah, oh, uh, you guys would really want to have the controversial stream today. I mean, it's a good software, but it's not beating Seabrush. And that's the thing. Seabrush has been going for, what, like 20 years now? So it's going to take a long time for those tools to really, like, get there. Um, it's a good option. Like, if you if you don't want to pay for the monthly subscription of the Seabrush and you want to do some basic stuff, it's definitely a valid option. Like, I'm not saying it's not a good tool. It's just that Seabrush is... It's, it's industry standard for a reason. And believe me, guys, I hate it as much as everyone else that they got bought by Maxon and that they are now subscription-based. I hate paying $45 every month just to get access to the tools. But hey, I mean, not much we can do about it. I mean, you can still, like, I have my old license, my Seabrush 2022 license, and that one's perpetual, so I could work there. But there are some handy tools on the new versions that I'm using, so so that's why I I pay for the license. But yeah, hopefully, like, I really hope Blender can get, a, like, better and better so that we can start, like, migrating there and using some of the other tools. But yeah... Sandra Pearson, uh, well, let me ask this one first. I'm an Enviro artist, and I did a lot of Enviro courses, and I just know the basic tools in Seabrush for Enviro proposals. Yeah, if you if you want to learn a little bit more about the character pipeline first, uh, with a lot of the tools, then the Seabrush course might be a good fit for you. Uh, try it out. I got a couple of free lessons there on the site, so you can just enroll, try it out, and if you like my teaching style and, uh, and the course, then you can just get it. Um, Sandra, we're going to link the Discord in just a second. Yeah, it's going to be there. It's, it's always on the description of my videos here on YouTube, but we're going to link the, the Discord in, in a second. There's a waiting room, so you're going to get into the waiting room, and then you're going to get approved in just a second, and you're going to be able to see all of the channels. I'm a white duck says, how to begin streaming? I want to be a teacher. I work in school with group but want to be more public. Um, I would recommend getting a setup, um, white duck. That's a great question. I mean, there's a ton of... <laughs> There's a ton of uh, tutorials on how to set up um, your stream. I use uh, OBS, which is uh, free for my uh, for my managing like the things that you see. Oh my god! For all of the things that you hear on the stream, the music and the audio and stuff, my best advice is do get a good microphone. Uh, I think a lot of people prioritize uh, a good video camera. But for us, especially in the 3D world where it's more about visual, I'd say a microphone is better. Uh, a good, thank you, thank you. A good one is the um, the Yeti, the Blue Yeti. It's a little bit pricey, but it's a good entrance microphone. That's the one that I've used for a long time. I recently upgraded to this one, which is a Shure MV7X. MV7X, I think it's one. But this one needs an audio interface and a little bit more setup. So just start with that and just start it. Like, to be honest, guys, most of the stuff is just go for it. <laughs> You're going to learn. Uh, Mr. Beast has a very famous quote. Probably you've seen him where he says your first 100 videos are not going to get any views or they're going to suck. But if you improve one small thing every video for 100 videos, then the difference from your 100 video will be way, way, way more than your first video. So that's a great advice. This channel that you're seeing right now, it has eight months. We started in in, in June last week, but I've been doing YouTube since 2020 uh, in other channels, and I've been teaching since 2015, um, and I've been doing 3D since 2011. So you just got to do something for a long time, and you get better and better at it. But there's a very important thing that you need to do, and this is for everyone, guys. This is probably one of the hardest things to learn, and I, again, thank my dad for, for teaching me how to do this. You got to be very, very honest with yourself. And whenever you finish something, a project, a contract, whenever you're working, always ask yourself, what else could I improve? Right? 
it's called in, in the industries, they call it continuous improvement. There's usually a huge department for this where they're trying to find ways to imp like improve the times, the quality, the efficiency of all of these things in their in their like uh, production pipeline. And if we do that as an artist, like if we take that information or that approach into our work and be like, okay, for instance, when I finished the Substance Painter course last week or two weeks ago, I went through like an introspection um, couple of days where I was like, okay, the course was a huge success. People like this. What could I do to improve it? Like if I had to do it again, what would I change? What would I like modify? And that's how you improve because the next time that I need to do something like Substance Painter related, I will take those things that I learned myself and the things that people tell me that I should fix or I should improve. And that's where you grow. That's when you become a great artist. And that's why we have this logo or this slogan right here. Always learning, always improving. That's how you do it. Okay, I'm creating this sort of like sharp horn effect. He's very pointy and I like the pointy bits. I don't want him to be like super edgy. But, but I'm, I'm seeing him more like a royal. So I want his horns to be like a crown. Because he's supposed to be a good dragon. I know he looks a little bit mean right now. This one looks a little bit grumpy. <laughs> And, and there's a change here. You can see the nose. Again, check the concept. It's a lot rounder. So I'm going to push the nose to make it a little bit rounder here on the front. And that's going to make him a little bit, again, like more grumpy. He's supposed to be like a grandpa. Grandpa drag dragon. So he's a no dragon. Same thing here on the chin. I'm going to push the chin forward a little bit. And that's the sort of stuff that we're going to have for a friendlier character he's still supposed to be menacing right he's supposed to be scary but he's supposed to be like scary friendly not scary evil can we make fur in seabrush you can use fiber mesh i honestly think it sucks <laughs> so if you're gonna learn fiber mesh just learn either like blender hair or or maya action and you're gonna get a better result we have a workshop we had a workshop a couple of weeks ago about the basics of, of uh, action because you want to check it out Ash says, hey, bro, doing your course like Saria, Seabrush, and Maya these days, they're great. Maya seemed hard to start because of general functional, but now it's okay. I think I'll stay in it despite the blender. Yeah, Maya is really good. Maya is really, really good. Um, I uh, Just a, a point there, Ash. I, I'm no longer part of Nextooth. I've mentioned this before. So if you ask questions on those old courses that I did, you're not going to get my answers. If you want to ask me directly, I still give support as a sort of... Uh, Thank you to all of the loyal students and fans along the years. So I'm still giving support even though I'm not getting any remuneration from that. But please uh, contact me on the Discord channel. So you can share your, your progress on those courses on the, on the Discord channel. And I'll be happy to, to help you out there. Do you have any Unreal courses planned? I'm currently having a rough time with landscaping. No, I don't, uh, Nida. But uh, it's been asked quite a bit. The thing is, I'm not really an environment artist. I know the basics of environment and I, I can do props for environments. But all of those like more intricate details, I know again the basics, but it's not something that I do a lot. So I'm I'm gonna be studying a little bit more on that so that I can offer a, a solution for you guys. Because they've been or people have been asking a lot for a for a um, unreal course. And I do feel like we could benefit from one. <laughs> I have tried sculpting in Maya, it sucks. You should not do any sculpting inside of Maya. Like, only do that if you hate your life. Yeah, it's really bad, so... Don't do it. Let's draw the little eye right there. That's a little bit closer to the concept. But there we go. Not bad, right? What do you enjoy creating the most in Seabrush? I really like humans and anatomy in general. I, I, I was going to be a doctor. I told you guys this. That was, that was my first uh, career choice in medicine. And then I realized, that, like, nope, this is not for me. And I went into, into game making or, or 3D. Um, but I really, really enjoy anatomy. Like the human body for me, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing too. 
to sculpt and to and to work. So whenever I'm doing male characters, female characters, any type of human or humanoid character, I love sculpting anatomy. Yes, first, if you if you cannot uh, if you don't like using um, what's the word? If you don't like using Discord, don't worry. I'll show you here. You can send me an email. What's my email here? I think it's on the. Is it, is it not? Is it not on the web page? Pretty sure it's here on the web page. Let's see. I'm pretty sure you can click on this icon right here on the email icon, and you can send me an email directly here on the on the page. Um, you can message me on Instagram as well, like a DM on Instagram, on LinkedIn even. So yeah. Sculpting in Maya is a sucky workout with no benefits. I work with 3D Furniture with promo, but this year the plans to take my first freelance with games for animation. There you go, Marco. That's nice. <laughs> I'm hating my life because I tried it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't do that. Sculpting in Maya is, is just, it's just bad. Even modeling, like I, I've, I've made this discussion before. Blender has better tools for modeling than Maya. I'm not gonna deny that. But in my case, I've been using Maya. Like Maya was literally the first software that I learned. Therefore, it's the one that I feel the most comfortable with and I'm way faster at Maya than, than Blender. But if I had to start over again and I had to learn about modeling, I would probably learn modeling instead of Blender. Animation though. Maya is better in animation. And I I will die on that hill. Rigging and animation in Maya is way way better than in in the that in Seabrush. Seabrush in Blender. It was like I started a Sharia project, but I like how fast you did hard surface in Maya um and the way it looks, so I got Maya course then. Yeah, Maya is really good. Like Maya is my main DCC application. And again, there's nothing wrong with your with your choice of DCC application. At the end of the day, what's important is that you are comfortable and that you can deliver whatever it is you're asking. For instance, here in the studio, uh, I have some or some of my artists. They used to work with Blender. Some of them used to work with Maya. Some of them even use only ZBrush. I don't mind as long as you can deliver the low poly and the high poly and get ready for the bakes so that we can get it into Unreal. You can use whatever it is you want. There was an artist that was doing um, textures in Procreate, for instance. She would get her arts, her iPad out and she would do the, the textures, the hand painted textures in Procreate. I don't care. As long as I can tell you to change something and you can do the change, go for it. But there are studios that are a little bit more specialized or they might have special like pipelines or plugins and well you need to adapt to that <laughs> you hated every part in modeling in blender i mean it's not that different i would say but yeah i can understand where you're coming from i migrate to blender because i'm brazilian one dollar here worth yeah Maya, it's very expensive. Uh, make sure to check, guys, if you're getting Maya, make sure to check if your country qualifies for the indie license. That's the one that I have. And as long as your revenue is below a certain threshold, the license is very, very affordable. Like, very affordable. Yeah, Procreate, you can load up an OBJ, and as long as it has UVs, you can literally paint on top of it. You can even paint, like, Metallic Channel and Specular and things like that. It's not, like, the best, but it's, it's, it's a good one. It's, it's fun. Especially for hand painted, I think it's a, it's a good alternative to like Mari for I don't know, like uh, 3D code for instance. Bacaloca, what's up, man? Welcome. So I think we did a good uh, a good progress on this one. I'm really really happy with where we were able to get to this one because we're about to end our stream, guys. We got ten more minutes. So if you got questions, now it's now or never. Now or never. Let's just do a little bit of cleanup in this final minutes while we read the last questions. And just a quick reminder, guys, all of this information and more you can find on the premium courses. That's also like because uh, I've gotten this question like, how, how, how can I support the channel? If you don't, um, if you want to support the channel for free, then liking, subscribing, following, sharing, that helps a lot. 
And if you want to support, the premium courses are our main um, like um, income for the for the support of this channel. So that allows me to to keep doing this and keep helping you guys. So if you want to get a course, feel free to check the the side right there. Amoxy Chilling says, "Do you have any online 3D school workshop to suggest? Looking to get past self teaching with paid courses." Um. I've heard Vertex is really good. Nomon has some online classes as well that are quite nice. I'm thinking about starting my own workshop as well, like live workshop. But I have not been able to find like the specific formula that I want to like share. But we'll probably do that in the next couple of months. CG Masters is good. I've heard that it's expensive though. I've heard that it's a little bit expensive. And yeah, uh, of course, like <laughs> our courses. But I, I think um, Amoxy was asking for more of a traditional class setup. I mean, one of the things that I like about my courses is that they're all in real time. So there's no speed uh, or time lapses or anything like that. So you can ask anyone here who has taken my courses. I try to make it as if I'm there with you teaching you the, the elements. So hopefully it feels a little bit more like a class. And also we have the support on the um, on the Discord channel so you can ask questions and everything. So it's not just it's not just you and the tutorial. We have a whole support network for you so that you don't feel um, abandoned. Yes, comments also help quite a bit. <laughs> just just a crack version. I mean, you can risk it, but there are some clients that will like make you pay for it like uh like you can get into some like really really bad legal issues. So, if you're just if you're just doing it for learning, I mean, you decide, but once you're actually making money off of it, you really want to make sure everything is like legal and everything. Are there schools that provide scholarships or some sort of these things? There are. There are some. I mean, I try to keep our courses as affordable as possible. But I do know that there are some schools. Like here in Mexico, the one that I teach at, um, Invaders Institute, they they do offer scholarships. At least, that's what I knew about. Good night, Saraf. Good night. Do you still do you still plan on doing a 3D print course for some cunning? Yes. So Nathan, the next course after the retopology course, which is going to be the anatomy course, will feature a section about 3D printing. So it's going to be like a combo of, of 3D printing and anatomy. We're going to be doing a character, uh, a superhero character, and we're going to be 3D printing it. And we're going to 3D print in both uh, printers. So it's going to be filament 3D print and um and resin 3d print and i'm going to talk about keying i'm going to talk about posing support placement all that stuff that one's going to be i was hoping i could get it in this month but seeing how things have been moving i don't think it's going to be able to be released on on march so it's probably going to be released early april because here um i don't know if you guys know but the, the easter week is about to happen it's in two weeks and in the museum where i work or where we have some projects going it's one of the busiest times of the year. So so I got to have my attention there for a couple of days. Did you finalize the character? What character is Solid Mango? The angons affect when you print? No, angons do not affect when you print. You just triangulate them and you're fine. I'm going to speak for Brazil. There's no way to pay for a system to study. Most of them are an easy one for the base seller with Blender. Can I do most of the work down? Yes, yes. If you're using Blender, you can do, I would say, 90% of what you can do with Maya. Yes. For the superhero course. No, no, no. I haven't even started that one. I'm working on the retopology course right now. Jones, hello from Malaysia. There you go. This dragon going to continue in another live stream? Yes, Thorodox. This is going to be an ongoing project. So we're going to be working every now and then. I want this to be like my personal project for this year. So I'm, I can't promise that we're going to finish it soon. But we're going to be working on, on more stuff. So today's live stream, the idea was to just get the basic shapes. I think we've just accomplished that. Let's... uh. Let's take a look at where we started. So, well, it started with a sphere, right? <laughs> but this was the other, like the model, like one hour ago. And this is now with some big changes. You can see how, how much of a change there is by just modifying this guys right here. And, um, and yeah, we started with literally just a sphere. 
Now, this live stream is also going to be available tomorrow here on YouTube. For all of you two guys, if you missed a part of this, make sure to subscribe to, to get the notification when this goes live. Do you think that the school is necessary? I've been surviving only with our station YouTube, and I don't know if I think it's like... Uh, as I've mentioned, Bacaloca, it's not... I mean, it's not necessary, but it is a huge help because you are going to get um, connections. You're going to get to know people, and that's going to probably allow you to get into the industry a little bit faster because you're going to get more opportunities. But it's not necessary. Like, I know people who were self-taught, never went to school, and got a job in the industry, so... Again, your mileage may vary. Ferris is asking, do you plan on doing a 3D modeling score course for games like Sculpting and Seabridge, importing to Maya Blender and doing Retopo and finishing it? <laughs> I love first when people ask me those questions because I can just say, dude, we already have it. So if you go here to the products on the site, these are all of the courses that we have. And that that you're asking for is this one right here. So the Blender 3D AAA Weapon for Games course is a modeling, sculpting, retopology, UV, texturing, and exporting into Unreal course. So it's like the full pipeline. It's here. It's ready. You can enroll right now. It's This one is 14 hours of, uh, of, of class to get to this final axe weapon right here. So so that one's like like ready. If that's what you're looking for, it's right here on the on the site. Now, for those of you who are like just starting their journey, my best advice is to start with either of these three, which is the Maya stylized world, if you want to learn about Maya, the Blender 3D, if you want to learn about uh, Blender, or the ZBrush, if you want to learn about ZBrush. These two right here, they're really good. I, I think we, <laughs> I think I was able to like pack a lot of information, but they are a little bit more advanced, I would say. So you don't really need to start with marbles if you don't know the basics of this ones right here. And the substance is like an addition, right? Like after you finish modeling, then you jump into, into substance to, to get the remaining stuff. Yes, yes, way more profit first. That's that's why we changed from Udemy to um, to my own site. Because even though Udemy is a really good platform, unfortunately, they do eat a lot of stuff. So you guys, as a students, you don't see it. You still pay pretty much the same amount. But for for me as the as the artist, we do get taken a lot of uh, chunk, like a, a lot of chunk of the of the stuff. Nice, Nathan. That's amazing. I really want to learn how to do molds for for my three D prints and stuff. Good night, I'm Oxy chilling. Good night. Well, that's it, guys. Thank you very much for coming to this live stream. I think we did a, I think we had a great time. I mean, we were able, again, to start with this project right here. And, again, this is not the end of this guy. We're going to be seeing him more. Sometimes I'm going to do videos uh, for the YouTube channel. Sometimes I'm going to do live streams. But this is going to be a um, like ongoing project that I'm going to be working for the next couple of months. So if you want to see more of this, don't forget to subscribe here on Twitch and on YouTube, of course. And uh, don't forget to join our Discord channel. Check our premium courses. Let me know what else you want to learn about. If you have questions, feel free to message me. I'm always trying to, to cover as much information as I can. So, yeah, that's it, guys. Thank you very much, my friends. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you back very, very soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Arn, also, for all the support. I'll see you guys back on the Discord.